My name is Joseph Buckley, president of John Reed and Associates. And in this brief video presentation, I would like to talk about the roles of projection and rationalization in the interrogation process. Let me first discuss the foundation for most successful interrogations. Think back to when you were a youngster, and let's say you got in a fight with one of your brothers, and your folks talked to you about that, and they said, did you hit your brother Jimmy? And you said, yes, Dad, I did. Yes, Mom, I did. And they would ask you, well, why would you do that? And what would we always say? He hit me first. We've all learned from a very young age and reinforced throughout our life that if we shift the blame for what we've done onto some person or circumstance other than ourselves, it might mitigate our punishment. Oftentimes when we do something wrong, particularly as we mature, we begin to feel maybe guilty about what we've done. Maybe there's a loss of self-esteem. Maybe we're highly stressed out or anxious about it. And one of the ways that we deal with these feelings is through rationalization or to try to justify our behavior through projection. Rationalization is essentially redescribing what we did so that we can avoid responsibility. So let's say, for example, I'm stealing money from where I work, but I rationalize that my intent is to pay it back. So because I'm paying it back, I'm really not taking anything. Projection is typically when a person shifts the blame for what they've done onto some person or circumstance other than themselves. The robbery suspect who accuses the victim of flaunting their wealth, engaging in ostentatious behavior, projecting the crime back to them. It's their fault they were robbed. Or an employee who is stealing money from where he works, feels that he has not been paid the overtime he was promised by the company, so he really is only taking what he is owed. He's not taking anything more than what they owe him. In the first edition of their book, going back to 1962, almost 60 years ago, Fred M. Bow and John Reed recognize these human experiences and how they can be used in the interrogation process. The key being to allow the subject to shift the blame for what they've done onto some circumstance or person or incident other than themselves that will help create an environment where they feel it's okay to tell the truth. The foundation of the interrogation process and the read technique is what we refer to as theme development in which we reinforce the subject's rationalizations and justifications for what they've done. We're really not introducing new ideas, we're just reintroducing what they probably have already thought of. Think of yourself, you're going down the highway and you're speeding. You know you're breaking the law, but you justify it in your head by saying, well, I'm not really sure what the speed limit is out here, I don't see any signs. I'm only going five or 10 miles over the speed limit, they hardly ever stop you for just going that fast. And man, I'm not going half as fast as that guy who's zooming by you. So we rationalize our behavior. All criminal deception is motivated through the hope of avoiding the consequences of telling the truth. Research has indicated that there are five techniques of neutralization that criminals use to reduce their perceived consequences. One of them is to deny responsibility. Look, I was drinking, I was down for loans of drugs, it wasn't really my fault, I wasn't really realizing what I was doing, etc. Denial of injury. Look, the victim wasn't really hurt that bad, I mean, it's not like the company's going to miss the money. With all the money they make, they're not even going to know what's going on. Denial of the victim. He deserved to be robbed. She wanted to have sex. Condemnation of the condemner. Look, everybody steals from the job. Everybody does it. Appeal to higher loyalties. The suspect didn't do it for himself. He did it for his family, who's so having medical issues. They need money to see doctors. He had a good reason. During theme development, which is the core of the interrogation process, we suggest these type of face-saving excuses to the subject, such as projecting blame away from them onto someone else. They came up with the idea, the victim's behavior, their emotions, alcohol, etc. So, having said all of that, as you prepare your strategy for an interrogation, you should ask yourself two questions. Number one, where can I place the blame and number two, how can I psychologically justify the subject's behavior? Now, the courts understand and recognize this process. For example, the Massachusetts Supreme Court stated in a case just a couple of years ago, quote, nor have we concluded that an interviewing officer's efforts to minimize a suspect's moral culpability 
by, for example, suggesting theories of accident or provocation are inappropriate. The Supreme Court of Canada stated there is nothing problematic or objectionable about police when questioning suspects in downplaying or minimizing the moral culpability of their alleged criminal activity. I find there was nothing improper in these and other similar transcript examples where the detective minimized the accused's moral responsibility. For additional information about the application of these principles in the read technique, I recommend you go to our website, which is read.com, and I'll put that up on the screen in a minute, and read one of our investigator tips called the Fundamental Foundation of the Read Technique of Interrogation, Empathy and Understanding. And we would also encourage you to look at our book, written by our Vice President, Lou Sinise, called Anatomy of Interrogation Themes, in which he goes through 60 different kinds of criminal cases, offering a total of 2,000 different themes that can be utilized to handle these kinds of interrogations. So again, you can access our investigator tips, as well as information about Lou's book, on our website, read.com. Thank you very much for taking a few minutes to listen to this program.